I remember it so clearly. He scored the winner in like the 85th minute or something. And I just thought, wow, what a feeling. You know, got back to the ground and then the managers pulled me and said, oh, the, you know, the gaffer wants to, to speak to you. I was in that office for probably you know, 30 seconds and I went from you know, scoring the winner for a team to being released from, from them in you know, a, matter of, a matter of minutes. And then I was playing football uh, literally down local five aside in, in Redditch with some of, some of my friends and then um, broke my leg in four places. So in 2019, we started planning a management consultancy. We in incorporated it at the start of March. Um, we, we go live, I think it was the 6th of March, 2020. Obviously, Sam's just left his job. He's uh, got, you know, a big mortgage. Yeah. Um, his wife is a stay-at-home mum. He's just had a new child, his second, and we've just started a business two weeks before we go into lockdown. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Daniel East podcast. This week's episode, we get to speak to somebody who's followed every boy's dream of becoming a professional football player, traveling the world, uh, but then unfortunately having to um, change because some accidents that happened along the way and pivoted into becoming an entrepreneur and a very successful one at that. One of his businesses that launched, in fact, back in COVID times, fast forward to today, has created from zero a multi-million dollar empire. So today we're going to learn the, uh, learn the story of how to come back from setbacks, uh, how to start businesses, how to learn from the exponential growth that comes with building a successful business and all the pain points along the way. So without further ado, join me in welcoming this week's guest, Liam Molesworth. How are we doing? Yeah, that was uh, yeah, quite, a, that was quite an intro. Here. That was expected to hear Cristiano Ronaldo. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, and yeah, welcome to the VTech. Yeah, 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 yeah. Didn't, Liam Molesworth. Didn't make it in the Saudi league. Now he's gone on track. Um, <laughs> it's good to be here. Yeah, yeah. I'm fine. Uh, first podcast, right? Uh, if, yeah, first, first proper podcast. Um, I've been on a few, but I've, this is the uh, the best setup that I've seen so far. Well, I'm, uh, I'm glad that we uh, we can, and especially on holiday as well. So, like, that's some proper dedication. Yeah. So you've um, you've plucked me away from my uh, very pregnant wife. Yeah. So uh, she's she's signed the application form for me to be out for a few hours. Nice, nice. So, who are you, Liam? Right. So uh, it's an interesting question. So I'm Liam Molesworth. I am about to turn 30 in, in June, um, getting a few gray hairs on the sides. Um, so I've got, I'm from a, a loving family. I grew up in Bromsgrove, just south of Birmingham. Uh, I've got two brothers, two sisters, uh, two foster brothers as well. And I sit right in the middle of everyone. So that was an interesting Big time. family then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Massive family. Um, when did your parents decide to, to foster? Uh, so it's when I was quite young. So I must have been about six or seven years old um uh my mum and dad really really kind people um you know salt of the earth people uh they were all they always wanted to do it and we'd always have you know things uh people like foreign exchange students coming around or different um you know different young people who you know hadn't been given the, the best start in life so they uh they took on uh darren and richard um and then when they were you know, grew up with them, uh, called them my brothers when they were 17 and 18, I think. My dad sent them over to, to Tenerife to work with his friend for the summer and uh, they never come back. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, both doing really well over there. Wow, what do they do? Uh, so um, they both work in sort of the excursion business. So uh, yeah, they both do excursions in, over in Tenerife. Still Thank in contact? You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were, I think we went, out of, we went out of contact for like a good sort of 10, 15 years. I should do with the, you know, I guess the lack of social media growing up and stuff. And then out of the blue, must have been about seven or eight years ago, they reached out to my to my mum on Facebook and sort of said, you know, never really realised what you did for us. We'd like to invite you out for a, for a holiday. And yeah, I think we go there every year now. Yeah, that's incredible because yeah, it's cool. My uh, my cousin um, actually fostered his uh, nephew, I believe it was. Yeah, nephew oh, and. Wow. Um, Unfortunately, it didn't end so well though, because some traumatic incidents yeah, from yeah. from childhood, and he was only a baby, to be honest. So, but they had to let him go because uh, unfortunate uh, unfortunate circumstances. So, 
it just goes to show kind of like how, again, how, how good your parents did with mm. having to deal with some of the, the traumas that will come from. Oh yeah. We, we had, you know, they weren't the, they weren't the, the, the first two people that, that came around. Um, you know, we've got stories about probably another four or five, you know, unfortunately young people who, again, just didn't have very good starts, um, you know, weren't from loving families were very, you know, disconnected from their parents and, uh, yeah, a lot of them used to run off and and be nightmares, but you can't blame them really. So um, yeah, Darren and Richard, I think my mom and dad did a really good job in in raising them, and they've got families of their own now. And yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to watch. And you've got you say you've got two brothers of your own and a sister. I've got two brothers, two sisters, two sisters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she's a huge family. Huge. Wow. I don't think they had a TV. So uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> a lot of kids. <laughs> But yeah, I sit right in the middle. Um, and again, you know, I've got a really good relationship with with my brothers and sisters. So yeah. uh, I'm really I'm really lucky to, to have how, such a good family. How did your parents manage to spread their time? I don't. You know what? It's when when you're growing up, um, you you really don't realise how hard it must be to to one, you know, have a family. And I'm going to go through that experience soon. But then two, like. My mum, I, I had, I got married um, last year, and I, I spoke, you know, for a good couple of minutes just about my mum because it wasn't until I was writing, my, you know, my speech mm. that you, you know, write all of the stuff down, and then you think, Jesus Christ, what a woman! Mm. Um, you know, my dad, uh, he had worked in football for his for his whole life, so he used to be one of the scouts at Liverpool, and that's why I support Liverpool. Uh, and then he worked, um, you know, during sort of in the lower leagues for for teams like Bristol Rovers and Mansfield and, you know, quite a few other teams. Um, but he was out watching football all the time, you know, two, three times a week. Um, he doesn't drive either. So he yeah. doesn't drive. No, no. Wow. Well, there's, there's another story about him driving, but I, I, won't, I won't share it about this podcast. He basically tried to learn, um, p failed his test five times and then just thought, fuck it. I'm just going to drive. Yeah. Uh, and drove for like 30 years without a license and then got caught. So he's, uh, <laughs> and he just hasn't, he hasn't bothered, he hasn't bothered to do his test. So he can drive. But, you know, not, <laughs> what a guy. Not legally. <laughs> Taking yeah. the law into his own hands. Yeah, he's a, he's, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a great bloke. Yeah. Um, but my point was, was, you know, imagine having five kids um, and being the only person that can drive. Yeah. And we're all into loads of different things. So you've got, you know, swimming lessons, football, uh, you've got to take people to their friend's house. You've got sleepovers. You've got et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then on top of that, she's got a full-time job. On top of that, she used to go to the gym every day. On top of that, um, we've got uh, her brother, my uncle's got learning difficulties. So she was caring for him as well. Um, and yeah. And, and then if that wasn't enough, she then did her master's degree in education. Wow. So it's just like, you know, growing up, Growing up, taking that for granted and then, you know, getting, being an adult, learning the value of time and money and, and where to, you know, spread your resources, you, you do stop and think, wow, how on earth did she do that? Yeah. Well, Mum, then, mums are super women really, aren't they? I mean, yeah. even just giving birth when you, act, like when you, I know it's a part of everyday life, mm. but think about the process of giving birth when you actually sit down and, and, and digest it. <laughs> It's like wow. Well, like, my, so, so, so my wife, she's expecting, uh, or we're expecting on July the second. That's the due date. Um, so, my wife, who's here in Dubai at the moment, like uh, you know, hand on the stomach every night, and you can literally feel the baby kicking and like punching the stomach, and it's so around. uncomfortable for her. Yeah, and you know, to carry that for a good nine months, it's just amazing. And then, obviously, you know what they have to go through at birth. I think we've got it pretty easy. To yeah, be fair. yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. All we need to do is go to work. Like, yeah, we got, we got a good deal. We've <laughs> yeah, got a good yeah, we've, deal. Got, we've got a great deal. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's all all very exciting. Were you like the cool social kid at school? Yeah, I used to. I, I was yeah, the most social person ever. Yeah. You know, um, teacher's nightmare. Yeah. Just speaking all the time. Um, you know, cause not causing too much trouble. I, I had a lot of respect for my teachers, but you know, class clown, trying to make everyone laugh, yeah. um, you know, in the football team, in every, you're doing every sport you could. Mm. Yeah. I used to, I used to love it. I used to thrive at school. Nice. Not so, not so much the actual learning, but, Le but learning the social part, element. The more social, social element. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because, um, I suppose what I'm trying to piece together is kind of like 
despite the football career where the entre entrepreneurial spirit came from because obviously she was a home mum right so you just take care of the kids or she had a job as well no no she's full time you know all no the, way all, yeah, yeah 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 so she had a she had a, like a, a a good job full time and as soon as we could kids were in nursery so wow yeah yeah like I, I don't know i can't remember what ages we went to nursery or whatever obviously but um yeah, yeah, she she worked. I was like, I was thinking, I was like, should I ask this question because it sounds like she just does so much that she wouldn't possibly have time for a full time job. No, no, she was a teacher, so she grew up. She was she was a teacher, wow. so you know, looking after even more kids. So it just it just must have been her calling to be you know looking after as many people as possible. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and obviously she's you know she's done a really good job with with a with a big family. So. Wow, wow. But you, um, when you finished school, you said obviously you, you enjoyed going to school, but didn't enjoy the learning part of it. So at what point did you kind of realize that, you know, you're relatively good at football, this could go somewhere? Yeah. So it wasn't, I guess it wasn't so much that I didn't, I wasn't good at it. I was, I was, I was really bright at school. Um, you know, on most of my reports, the teachers, the teachers would say, and actually it's quite funny, um, I think my wife dug out one of the school reports and it was from a chemistry teacher um, who just, you know, we used, I used to just try and play jokes on him all the time. Uh, and he basically just said, would rather be the class clown than actually, you know, learn something, um, which just sums me up com completely. Social skills are important though, right? They are you know? important. <laughs> obviously, so is, you know, so is education, but I just didn't ever feel the need to take that seriously. Mm. Um, and then in terms of football, you know, I've played football since I was about six or seven years old. Um, when I was growing up, uh, started playing for like the Birmingham County team. So that's when I thought, oh, okay, I'm getting selected for, you know, um, better teams. And, you know, basically the county team is away from professional clubs, the best team in, in the Birmingham region. Um, and this, I played in a team with some, some absolutely fantastic players who are now sort of Premier League and Championship players in that team. Who did you play with? Uh, so a good friend of mine's Amari Bell. He's hopefully about to be promoted with Luton Town into, nice. the, into the Premier League um yeah there's, there's, a, there's a few others so so yeah when I was about 15 16 um you know started training with the likes of, of Warsaw um and then basically was playing for Birmingham County up in the in the FA County Cup against Northumbria I want to say um and I started as a sub and then came on because uh, someone got injured in like the, the 20th minute, the striker um, came on, scored two, we won the game. And I think there was a, like a, a scout there from, from Inverness, Caledonian Thistle up in the, up in the Scottish oh, Premier wow. League. Yeah. So, so whilst I was still at sixth form at this point, um, started sort of playing up in, in Scotland. So I went up to, to live in Scotland for a little bit um, and was playing for, for their youth team. So, at that point, I was like, okay, I've got a bit of a decision to to make here. You know, coming to the end of my A levels, um, which you know I wasn't really interested in in going to uni. I would have just gone for the sake of it, like a lot of other people. Um, or you know, do I see where football can take me? Um, so yeah, there was a there was a few arguments at the table with obviously my you know my mom being in education, my dad yeah. being in the football industry yeah 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 what, what you, your dad's like do. yes come on <laughs> <laughs> sort of yeah so so yeah it wasn't it, it was really late to be honest um so like 15 16 when i was you know just getting into year 11 and then sixth form it wasn't until then that i thought you know what why don't i try and, and give this a little bit of a go and so. um what was it like leaving leaving home so young what you a level so you must have been around 16 yeah yeah so i think when i went to inverness i was 17 and then um was getting on really really well there and you know getting on with the team um was only there for for, for a few months and i played my first game for them uh again. for the youth I, team yeah well it was it was actually team. it was it was it was a first team game but because it was like i think it was like a highland cup game or something so you know one of those pre-season cups that you yeah, know, first yeah. team doesn't take seriously and they send a mixture of first team and, and reserve and under 23 players so um was playing in that and i scored the the winner i remember i remember it so clearly I scored the winner in like the 85th minute or something 
And I just thought, wow, what a feeling, you know. Um, we were away, so on the coach back, and it was almost like crunch time of whether I was going to sign a, a professional contract with them. So um, on the on the way home, you know, all the lads are, are buzzing, oh, you know, it was going to be good to have you here permanently and blah, blah, blah. And then um, got back to the ground and then the managers pulled me and said, oh, the, you know, the gaffer wants to, to speak to you. With the UFC managers pulled me and basically said, you know, the gaffer wants to speak to you in the office. And, you know, just black and white, just basically said, look, don't want to sign you. Don't think you're, don't think you're good enough for us. And um, yeah, good luck with, with football. And, it, and I, was in the, I was in that office for probably, you know, 30 seconds. And I went from, yeah, scoring the winner for a team to being released from from them in you know, a matter of a matter of minutes. Wow! Yeah, that must was, have been quite. A... I was tough. I, you know, I, I, I held it in, and then you know, as soon as I got dropped off at my digs, I went to my room and just cried my eyes out because I was. I didn't know. I'd, I'd never experienced, experienced anything like that before. And it's it's not just about the the, the release. It's also the rejection. Yeah, it was it, it was it was really odd because I went into that I went into that office thinking the conversation was going to be about me signing a professional contract and I came out of it being released. So it was just a completely different, um, you know, situation to what I envisaged. Did, uh, did you think that the, the, the kind of manager just didn't like you or, cause obviously you, you scored the winner of a, of a, of a goal, you know, like uh, of a game, sorry, you came on, you scored the winner. Like, so it shows like you... football, football's a, a foot, what I've learned. I know everyone will say this is football is a game of opinions. And unfortunately, if your manager doesn't think you're good enough, you're not, you, you know, you're not good enough for that team. And also what football has proven is you only need to have, you know, one good game and people are there watching at the right time and you can go on and have a successful career and someone believes in you. Um, so it was just, it was just one of those situations. Um, and I, I genuinely, I got a flight home probably the next day, you know, sort of packed my stuff up, called my parents, uh, organized a flight home. And it just made me never want to play football ever again. And I just thought, what do I do now? Because mm. I've sort of got average grades to to either go to the to, to a uni with, or what are the other options? Um, so, guy who was sort of looking after me at the time um, had a contact over in Australia. Uh, so he sort of said, "Look, you know, it's because the season works differently over there. Um, we can." get you a, a contract over there and I just thought why not just turned 18 um didn't really have any you know responsibilities or, or reason to be in England apart from my family and I've always been very very independent even from like you know a really really early child I used to go off on my own and um I don't know do do weird things that normal five and six year olds just wouldn't have the courage to do yeah, yeah. so I just said yeah let's go so um so when I was 18 flew out to to Adelaide um, and and was there for for two years playing football. How much were you getting paid then? Not a lot. Yeah, yeah not 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 a lot at all. Um, were you, was it enough to like kind of have a good lifestyle, or do you have yeah. to work on the side? Or you, yeah, you yeah, just yeah. Did so 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 the way that the way that the football works over there is because obviously it's too hot to uh, to train in the day. Everyone trains at night time, and you might train at night, you know, three or four times a week. Um, and I didn't know anything about the team that I was going to, the t you know, the, the teammates, um, where I'd be staying, what the setup was, what the club was like. I've, I almost just went, I've got nothing else to do. I'll just go out and, and have a bit of a, you know, a bit of a jolly up and, and play football. And I loved it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they put me in a, a house with a guy who worked there. So I was staying with him. Um, so obviously the accommodation was, was sorted. Um, we'd train a few nights a week. Uh, and then, yeah, played really, really well in that in that league. Um, it was the one sort of below the the NPL, which is the National Premier League, um, and the standard wasn't very good. And I was, you know, young, fresh out of playing professional football every day for for Inverness. So I was I was quick um, and, and scored loads of goals. Got some interest from a team in the in the NPL, um, and then went to I spent the next season at a, a team called Adelaide Blue Eagles, and that's when you know, you're playing at a, a decent level. Um, that's when I was getting paid a decent amount. Um, and then because obviously they, they train in the nights, that's when I got my first proper sales job. So I had nothing to do in the day. 
you know, as every board um, young person, jobs, mm. go on Gumtree, jobs, Adelaide, first thing that came up, uh, it was like paintball sales rep. I was just like, <laughs> I've played paintball before. Uh, there's a number on there. Called the guy up. He was like, oh, I'm only, yeah, I'm only, I won't butcher the Australian accent, but I'm only two streets down. Why don't you come around for a chat? So I drove my car around there and had a job in about 15 seconds. You know, can you work tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. All right, turn up in these clothes and we'll, we'll run you through it. And you were literally just selling paintballs? We were selling, we were selling paintball tickets. So okay. um, they just opened their first ever paintball site in 40 minutes outside of Adelaide. And, um, they, all they wanted was loads of people to go there. To, and then obviously they made their money by uh, by people being there and spending mm. loads on paintballs. Yeah. So what we were doing was just flogging these pieces of cardboard as tickets. So you had 10 tickets on there um, and getting people to go paintballing. And it was and it was a commission-only job. So if you didn't sell anything, you you would actually owe the company money because you had to rent out some of the, some of the shopping centres. And I just found it really interesting Um I remember on the first day, we the, the guy Richard, who was the manager of the of the office, he sort of sent everyone out to different locations, and he said, "Liam, go with these guys, two guys who are the good good sales reps," and um, he said, "Just shadow them for the day, just see how they do it, see if you can learn anything, and mm. tomorrow or you know this week we we might get you you know confident enough to go and sell stuff." And I was like, "Okay," so they set up a, a street stall outside of the uni there. And I was just watching these watching these two guys just like, I just thought, I can do a better job than this. Mm. So sort of learned what they were sort of saying, learned a little bit about what the site was like and stuff. Um, asked one of the guys, you know, how do you use this card machine? And then just started speaking to people. And then the way that it works is you go back to the office at the end of the day and you report how many of these packets you, you, you basically sell. And I think that, you know, the one guy sold two packets, the other guy sold four and then in like my first ever day, I sold like 16 packets of these paintball tickets. Yeah. And it was like, I, you know, just discovered fire and it was, it was really bizarre. I was, I was just, I was just like, I was just speaking to people. Yeah. I think probably you have a, you have a bit of an advantage being from England and being yeah. in a different country because people want to, people are sort of uh, yeah. drawn to your accent. And being a good looking lad as well. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, Did you sell all the know. paintball tickets <laughs> to girls? Yeah. <laughs> to be fair. Yeah. My, my, um, my most popular client base was like, uh, you know, middle-aged women whose uh, you know, sons would have birthdays in the next couple of months. That yeah, was like yeah. my, my go-to. Um, so yeah, I did that for for, for quite a while um, and be became one of the most successful like sales reps for their business. They're not they're not a small outfit. They're quite the, they're quite a big company around the world. Um, and and yeah, I, I loved it. I used to get up in the morning, look at a map of of Adelaide and then look at where loads of shops were and just take a card machine with me and some and some tickets and just walk into random offices and businesses and just started flogging tickets to people um so yeah that was almost like in a weird way the first experience where i thought right i'm actually good at something else here and if football goes to shit i can quite easily sell things yeah. And I suppose it quite links quite well into to what you were saying at the beginning, like your school days being very sociable. Mm. Sales is such a sociable job. Like, 100%. you know, with my, with my job, like sometimes I get to the weekend and I just want to be alone because I've just yeah, been around yeah. people for the whole week. Yeah. Um, but it is a very social, social job. But so you was managing the both between, and, and what, what was you enjoying the most? Were you still enjoying football or did you actually start to enjoy work more than football? No, I was enjoying football. Yeah. I, I I loved I love football. There's nothing better than being around, uh, you know, a group of teammates and uh, being in the dressing room, giving each other banter, and then, you know, almost going to war on the weekend with each other and, and grinding out a result. I absolutely loved it. Um, and then obviously, you know, being young, uh, there was other young people there. A lot of obviously um, expats over in in um, Australia. A lot of British people. So I became some of some of my best friends were over there, and they're. You know, their family emigrated there from England um, and we used to just go out all the time. Uh, so yeah, real good uh, social life. Um, and then I actually started making more money from selling paintball tickets than my actual job playing football, <laughs> which is crazy. Yeah. So I was doing quite well over there. Um, and then, you know, the season comes to an end. 
you start feeling homesick, um, especially as old, you know, my older sister had a baby that I was sort of missing out on on being there uh, with my family. And obviously I'm very family orientated. So uh, there's always part of me that wants to go back and, and mm. visit. So, yeah, the end of the end of the season came um, and then there was a team uh, that wanted to sign me from from Sweden. So I went and lived in Stockholm for a year playing professional football out there. And what was that like? Bit of a culture change between the heat to the cold. Yeah, massive culture. Summer's change. quite nice though, there, right? Summers. I've probably had one of the best summers in my of my life in in Sweden because it's it just never ends. So well, obviously it ends and gets really cold, but yeah, in terms of the just, days, yeah, the day it's just there's no there's no darkness, is there? Sort of. So so in the middle of summer, sort of between uh, you know the middle of June and and August, um, it gets lighter and lighter and lighter, and you know you'd be out. For example, uh, at a nightclub, uh, which I don't know, be out on a, on a terrace having a drink or whatever, and the sun would just go down at probably about three in the morning, and then at probably three thirty, so it sort of feels like it's just you know sunset, and at three thirty it comes back up, so everyone just stays out all the time. So it's it's a really really bizarre place to be, um, but yeah, again, made some some really really good friends in Sweden. Did um, you manage to speak the language or? I, I got by if you ask me to do it now I've, I haven't practiced it in in, in ages um, but we had a a manager from I want to say Serbia um, and he didn't speak any English so there was only me and one other English guy at the club and um, we'd have to get sort of everything translated at the start so literally the Osgan who was the manager would um you know, do his team talk. And then the assistant manager who could speak English would then get me and Ben over in the corner and be like, right, this is what he said. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a massive culture shock going from Australia, which is basically a hotter version of England to Sweden. And that's when you start mixing with a lot of different nationalities. And, you know, we had, um, we were actually living in the same sort of apartment block as, as four players who uh, were on loan from a Brazilian Premier League team. So they just spoke Portuguese. Um, and yeah, even though we had these amazing different or completely different cultures and languages, we were all like best friends because yeah. we could communicate through, you know, football. So yeah. it was, it was, it was a really, um, yeah, positive experience in Sweden. And were you getting played regularly there or? No, I wasn't to be fair. I definitely, um, I remember I got in, <laughs> it sums me up. I got in trouble, uh, pre-season we, we flew out to we flew out to turkey to do like a pre-season training camp and um again you know first night me and the english lad start getting on the beers you know it's pre-season training camp just signed a contract for them it's supposed to be impressing everyone and um yeah we got caught having a party in our room we we and obviously the the hotel that we're staying in uh you know the management had been given strict orders not to serve anyone alcohol and we were giving um, one of the waiters like 50 quid every time that he bought mm. a tray of drinks and stuff. So, yeah, we, we almost got off on the wrong foot to, in, in Sweden. Um, and to be honest, uh, I'm, I'd like to think that I've got the ability to assess, you know, myself in terms of whether I was good enough to, 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 to be playing a really, really high standard and make mm. football a career which was life-changing. Um and there were a couple of people playing in my position who I'm really good friends with now. Like we speak with all the time, Omar Adari uh, and Philip um, Rogic. And, you know, they, they both went on to play, you know, for some of the best teams in, in Sweden. So there was a part of, you know, the manager didn't really like me. We, 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 we did get on, but we got off on the wrong foot. And there were two people playing in my position who were really, really good footballers. Um and that's proven because they went on to have a really successful career mm. in football and I didn't. So yeah, uh, I didn't play as much as I wanted to, but it was almost like I always knew in football, how long is this going to last for? Yeah. Um, and when I got back to after the, after the season, we won the league, had a really um, yeah, amazing season together, got back to England, uh, went to watch my sister get married. And then I was going to go back to Sweden in, in the new year. Um, and then I was playing football uh, literally down local five aside in, in Redditch with some of my, some of my friends and then um, broke my leg in four places. So that was almost like a, a moment in my football career or career in general that I thought, right, you know, use that as a you know kick up the arse and, and it's time to go and get a proper career now. 
Um, and I didn't actually at the time. I, I almost had this, you know, burning desire inside of me to prove to myself that I could get back on a football pitch because yeah. I knew how, you know, how low I was. And I went from, um, you know, being with a full-time physio and having a team of people that would, you know, get you better to out of contract, no money coming in, sitting on my parents' sofa at home, um, eating my body weight in Doritos and on the NHS. So I, me I remember going to my first physio session um, and I was teaching the physio exercises to do. And I just thought, I'm a bit fucked here. So I went back out to, to Australia, but I was um, I knew that I was a yard behind. Mentally, I wasn't there. I always had in the back of my mind, right, you know, time to go and get a, a proper career. Um, so that's when I started in recruitment. And you got into, was it healthcare recruitment you got in from the beginning or? No, it wasn't. So, um, so came back from, came back from Australia and, uh, again, living with my parents. Um, and I just met my, my wife and um, obviously back then with my girlfriend, Erin. Did you meet, um, Australia or in England? In England. So I've come back, uh, came back from, from Sweden. And as I was sort of doing like my rehab and everything, um, met her and we, we sort of knew each other from, from, um, working at a, a clothes shop in the past, but we'd never actually worked together. Uh, and then saw each other on a night out and, and sort of the rest is mm. history. Um, so yeah, that's how I, I met Erin. How did you feel when you had to go back to starting from scratch? Did you enjoy the sales side of things? Going to starting from scratch is, is a really humbling experience. Um, and especially playing, uh, playing football. I see it, I see it so much now with young footballers thinking that they've made it or young people in general the next generation of people or, uh, want everything straight away they want to be a millionaire overnight and they're, they're not prepared to build something that's sustainable and you know when you're not prepared to build a sustainable business or a sustainable career things can you know change overnight and people aren't prepared for it um, and I was, I was, I was one of those people, you know, thought that I was good at what I was doing. Um, all of a sudden you've got a broken leg on your parents' sofa with no money. Mm. You're, you're, at, you're at rock bottom really. Um, obviously there are, you know, way worse positions that you can be in in life, but in terms of my career, yeah. I was, I was in a pretty shit place. Um, so I knew that I was, could sell things. Um, someone sort of said, you know, do you want, uh, an opportunity to work in recruitment? turned up to an interview and I genuinely didn't even know what recruitment was. Um, like three or four interviews later, got the job at a big recruitment firm um, in Birmingham, but they've got a presence all over the world. And uh, my first market was trying to recruit for software developers just in the West Midlands. Mm. So like completely different to what I was doing. Um, yeah. And you know, software developers, and this is me being very stereotypical, but the clash of personalities with me being um, very yeah. extroverted. Extroverted and they're an introvert. It was just, must yeah. have been very difficult. Re yeah, obviously not all of them were, but but the, the majority of the people that I was trying to build relationships with and almost like force them to go for a beer or uh, yeah, a meal with me and, and try and develop a relationship that way, they were very much headphones in mm. want to concentrate on coding all day and they don't want to go and meet Liam for a beer after work. Yeah. So it was, it was really, um, I did quite well at it to be fair considering, but it, it wasn't a, a market that I, I really gelled with. Yeah. And then, um, moving on from there, my, so my, uh, business partner, Sam Allsop Hall I was now. Say, at what point did you decide to, to, to go up on a, on your own? Yeah. So, so, I was there for about eight months, nine months, and then I became like the most senior person on my market. My manager didn't my, didn't do my market. wasn't really enjoying the dynamics of the company and how rigid it was. Um, a lot of very very KPI focused, and everyone was forced into the same direction. So wasn't really enjoying it. Uh, and then I got introduced to Sam through a mutual friend. Basically, he got headhunted. He he was working for the same company. A different brand of the same company um, in their healthcare division. He got headhunted by another big company to go and set up their healthcare division for them. Um, got uh, we got connected through a mutual friend. Then he basically said, "Right, do you want to come and set up this division for me? It's called Continuing Healthcare, 
um, you know, it's a, a really uh, profitable division for where I was working. Mm. And, you know, you're effectively number two. I said, yeah, again, didn't know what it was on my first day. He sort of gave me the the fundamentals and the structure of who our clients were, what we were recruiting for, who our candidates were. This is what I suggest you do. See you in two weeks. I was like, oh, right. So I went from being in a in an office to how many minutes have you spent on the phone today? How yeah. many calls have you made? How many CVs have you sent out? You know, all of the classic KPIs in, in recruitment to see you in two weeks. It's like, right, okay, best best start trying to think on my own and do something. Yeah. Um, so I think two weeks later, Sam comes back. How did you get on? I was like, yeah, I've done, you know, three deals. He's like, oh, right, wasn't expecting that. Um, and then started doing really, really well in our first year. Um, and then the company actually sold to a big asset management company for about 100 million. And uh, as a like as a, a theme in the company, they just focused on on tech recruitment. So our little healthcare bit that we just you know built in a year, and we were doing some good numbers. But when you're looking at a, a business that turns over you know a billion pounds mm. or a billion dollars a year, our little healthcare bit it was nothing. So they made our healthcare division redundant. Um, Sam went down the management consultancy route, uh, worked for um, a private sales company that did healthcare um, systems, uh, selling into hospitals. And then that's when I started Woodrow Mercer Healthcare um, with a guy that had founded Woodrow Mercer Group. His name's Dan um, and Andrew and Mark. They're the other shareholders of our company. So I basically said, look, let's go into business together. You can provide all of the things that I'm shit at. So, you know, contracts, finance, yeah. uh, marketing, you know, all of the stuff that is the backgrounds of a, of a business. Um, and I'll just go and do the front end sales and, mm. and, and build and build sales. Said, yeah, let's do it. So again, started growing really, really quickly. Um, I, I, I was almost in a really lucky position because I'd built up a network of, of clients and, and mm. candidates and customers over a year. Um, and then got made redundant because they're not going to do it anymore. So I could still speak to those people. Obviously, you know, if you were to do that at any other company and leave, you'd have restricted covenants. Um, so I could still engage with all of those people that I'd, I sort of worked with. So yeah, did um, started growing really, really quickly. Uh, started hiring people because the you know the, the ma- demand was there from from our customers. Um, and then in two thousand and. 20 that was 2000 so that was 2018 yeah i was gonna say because there's a very pinnacle point in this because there's a lot of articles out there where (laughs) where they talk about the success from covid till now yeah i mentioned at the beginning and there was an exponential growth in between those in in those periods but at what point so you obviously went to work with your business partner now um and at what point did you decide to found the, the the clive henry group Sure, it's a good question. So, so Woodrow Mercer Healthcare was born in 2018, strictly recruitment. Um, and then, you know, if you're if you're one of our customers and you just wanted someone, we could, you know, to come in and help, we could supply a CV. Mm. Effectively, that's as, as complicated as it gets. Um, in so in 2019, Sam and I are we work very very well together, um, and it was very very obvious to both of us. And when we went our separate ways. We'd always be speaking outside of work saying, look, you know, yeah. what can we do next and how can we work together again? Da, 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 da. So in 2019, we started planning um, a management consultancy that effectively does the same areas that we recruit for. So we start planning it back end of 2019, you know, planning it for about six months. He's about to uh, leave his uh, job as managing director at this other company paying very, very well. Um, and we've literally spent six months planning it. We incorporated it at the start of March. Um, we, we go live, I think it was the 6th of March, 2020. It's just had, that was, that was, I think 7th of March was literally when lockdown happened here. Cause I remember yeah, I was meant so, to be flying to England. So it was, and, it was, um, I think it was seven. I think we went into lockdown 18th of March in the UK. So obviously Sam's just left his job. He's, uh, got you know, a big mortgage. Yeah. Um, his wife is a stay at home mum. He's just had a new child, his second. And we've just started a business two weeks before we go into lockdown. Holy fucking shit. This yeah. is a really bad decision. So um, we thought, right, 
this is terrible. We've planned this really badly. What can you do? Let's just almost focus on our recruitment side of the business. Mm. Because obviously, sp- lucky we're in healthcare. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, I suppose with healthcare, it was booming, right? Yeah, but we, n- no one knew what was going to happen. Mm. So it was a very, you know, unprecedented was the was the word everyone was using. Um, and it was one of the best things that actually happened to us. Obviously, it was a very sad place to be in the world, but in a selfish business perspective. Yeah, but also as well, you can't control the outside. I mean, you, you were supplementing people being able to, to live effectively because you're supplying the people that were needed to be there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, we, you know, we, we thought, right, how terrible would it be if we don't make the most of this opportunity? You know, I was playing mm. probably like you, PlayStation yeah. at night with your friends because you couldn't see them. And, you know, night after night, oh, I've been made in London today. I'm on furlough. I'm, you know, I don't think I'll be able to go back to work. And, you know, we're there sitting, you know, sitting on a massive opportunity. So we wanted to make the most of it. So Sam and I were working... 17 hour days seven days a week for the first probably three or four months um just to try and get improve off the ground Mm. um and because what we focus on in the two sides to our business um and effectively in in boring terms we make capacity for hospitals hospitals obviously get paid on on the number of operations that they do they can't do operations if their if their beds are full so yeah. they have to try and discharge people. So they've got beds to do operations. So obviously during COVID, they needed all of their beds for COVID patients. So yeah. we're there, you know, our business model is a freeing up capacity. Obviously we got quick, uh, we got busy really, really quickly. How did you manage to do that though? Like, how did you manage to like, is it software based? Um, or? Partly. So it'd be, it, would, it would be, our consultancy model would be taking in the very best consultants who specialize in those areas, but then also implementing you know different tech into into the into their system uh, which would make mm. their job easier and obviously be they'd, they'd be allowed to work more efficiently um and then obviously that's almost when tech canal was born so obviously we've gone through this period of of, of rapid growth mm. through um through covid which we did make the most out of it and then um just last year we uh, started a company called tech canal because what we were doing is we were going to our um clients and offering them a consultancy service but then almost just bringing in you know tech as we saw fit and then we'd staff the projects exclusively through our recruitment company so we went okay well instead of just bringing people in for free why don't we make a tech canal which effectively works with all of the different tech products that are trying to penetrate the nhs but they don't know how um the nhs is such a complex maze of you know commissioning uh red tape frameworks you need to be on networks that you don't have so all of these tech companies that have genuinely life-changing products that could be you know revolutionary revolutionized yeah the way it runs yeah they don't know how the nhs works because it's so hard from someone from the outside who's not already in it Mm. to start selling their their products do you think it's do you think i mean when an organization runs like that do you think it's because it's maybe not run as efficiently as it should do and they 100%. don't want people to know about it yeah obviously yeah. so because it's it's quite i mean with these type of organizations you always find out about the people that are on the big bucks and and, and really protecting themselves so they really like shadow it from from the until rest of the world. until so what, my um perception of what the nhs was before i started working in the nhs all i could think about was you know a nurse and a doctor on a ward that's like my perception of what the nhs was and until you actually dive into it, there are so many layers to the NHS and everyone needs to be on point for the whole machine to to work. And it's the biggest machine in, in the UK. I think it's the, the highest mm. employer in the UK, biggest company in the UK. Um, but the problem that the NHS has got is, or the problem that the UK have with the NHS, you've got less and less people qualifying to be clinicians every year or, or qualifying to go and work in the NHS every year. So that number's getting lower and lower. But then at the back end of the NHS, you've got people leaving, you know. Because they're unhappy. A, a, lot, a lot sooner. So Too much people are taking hours, not enough pay. Of course, of course that. So people are taking early retirement. So you've got less and less people every single year working in the NHS. But then what's happening to the, to the amount of people that are using the NHS every year? It's getting more. It's getting more because... The average age of death in the UK is going up and up and up. 
and they want to try and get you know care out of the hospitals and into the community so how how can we get the nhs to do more work with less people and the answer to that is make it run more efficiently make it run more efficiently with technology so we started tech canal um and you know homage to birmingham's canal system which actually has more canal than venice which is a fact um and it almost yeah it almost uh signifies you know the, the canal's first industri- industrial revolution you know mm. taking things to places taking goods to places and now we're on almost this you know technology revol- revolution um and yeah we try and bring life-changing tech into the nhs by using our networks and forming it as part of our consultancy so yeah if you would have asked me when i was playing football what are you going to be doing in five years time yeah i wouldn't have just said that yeah well, it's quite fascinating isn't it like the journey that you go on because i mean uh, i resonate with that a lot because my journey was very similar mm. i won't go into detail about it now but it's exactly the same i went off and did one thing realized that it wasn't for me i could do something different that was going to make me more money and 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 went off into a different path but um you obviously i mean there's been a lot of uh articles that you've been in and you've featured in because obviously you've been making you know a lot of impact in 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 the health service so not just obviously doing really well you've made an impact and that's obviously driven um like a lot of attention towards you guys but how how do you i mean because starting a business is one thing yeah you know but then there's running it and then there's also getting to the point where you're going from nothing into turning over millions of pounds a year yeah um how did you deal with that growth by hiring great people so we, I, I suppose being in recruitment you yeah, kind of got we've, yeah. we've almost got, yeah we've almost we've almost got uh, or we should have an, a, a talent for, for recruiting good people because it's what we do practice what you preach um but we've we've always grown very organically so you know we haven't taken any um outside investment um everything has been you know growing as demand hits um and you know fortunately for me we've got somewhere between 35 and 40 people that work for us and they're so talented Mm. and um they're a pleasure to work with and i definitely couldn't run the business you know without the people that work for us um so yeah i think in answer to your question is making sure because obviously you learn your lessons and you hire bad people as well but that's obviously you know how part you of the learning process, part of the learning yeah. process um but trying to really look after the the people that look after you and obviously we're in sales right so a lot of the people that work for us we we are dependent on them mm. um because they're they sell our services so yeah. yeah i'd say the trick is um with any r- rapidly growing company is just make sure that one you've got uh you know the right people in the right seats of of the bus mm. um and make sure that you're looking after them uh, yeah. and then it just it just raised like we've we've got really really high standards and it's amazing when you've got a set of people that are so accountable to those standards when new people come in they either get sucked up to that level or they just think Phew, this is too much for me mm. and and they're, they're not there very long um so yeah the, the people that, that work for us are definitely responsible for how quickly we're growing what about the mistakes you've made oh loads yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely loads what do you want to know the biggest biggest mistake. what would you say yeah what would you say is the biggest mistake you've made um the biggest mistake that we've made that's a really really good question again it probably comes like i'm i'm I'd like to be very, very efficient. So I don't like wasting any time. Um, every hour of the day is like, right, you know, you're doing this, you're doing this and you're doing this. And there's nothing worse than wasting mm. your time and other people's time. And I think we have had a few people that have worked with us in the past that, you know, haven't been great people. And we're, we're very, very strict on um, the values of our company. So we've got four values and as long as you are doing those four, I don't really give a shit about anything else. Yeah. yeah. What are the values? Yeah. So we've got um, work ethic, maturity, respect, and focus. So obviously they're all very self-explanatory, but especially in sales, I always say if you're doing all of those four, 
the performance and you know the um, accolades and the accomplishments and growth in your career will definitely come you know if you're doing three out of the four we've got a big problem mm. if you are you know if you are billing the most money for us and you're a really high performer for us and you're not doing one of those values we've got a big problem so i care way more and we go back to you know the kpi aspect we don't really have any kpis apart from are you doing those four values and if you are lo and behold you're often really performing as well so going back i think that trying to when we've hired people and they haven't been doing those four values keeping them on too long and you know trying to go oh but they're making us a lot of money and you know let's just see it out that's been a, a massive sort of i wouldn't say waste of time because you learn from it but it's it's consumed a lot of uh, time by trying to keep people in the seats when mm. you know that they're not going to work out have you made that mistake no more than once yeah i guess so i guess um we haven't made it a lot yeah and we we, we haven't really ever had someone leave and go to a competitor which is a really good sign that we're, we're doing something good okay so we do really look after our our employees um but you know everyone interviews really really well don't they so oh. <laughs> Mate, this is uh, it's the bane of my life. Yeah, like yeah, you, ha you have to just kind of like sometimes. I mean, I'm I'm I'll be honest. Like one of my worst worst abilities is being able to really see through the shit. Yeah, it's, I find it so difficult, especially with sales. Yeah, because everyone tells you a good story. Everyone knows what you want to hear. We but stopped. Then, we've we've li we've literally stopped asking people about their performance in sales. Yeah, don't, don't care. Not interested because yeah. it's always right when we hire people who come in with a bit of a chip on their shoulder and you know they've said that you know I'm, I'm the first in the office i'm last out this is what i build da, 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 da. this is you know the amount of money that we make it's, it's always the same ones yeah. you know yeah I, I, did, I did the same recently as well with somebody is i because all the mistakes that i made i just turned around and rather than ask them about their sales i'm like i want to know who they are correct you know yeah. and you hire on character yeah so you know what are you what are you striving for outside of work What's your relationship with your friends like? What's your relationship with your family like? Mm. What's your why? Why yeah. do you want it? Why why do you want to come in come and, work for and, us, yeah. and make money? What are you what are you trying to work towards? Yeah, and and really dig deep into why someone wants to be in that seat yeah. rather than why they should be in the seat. I yeah, uh, I once interviewed someone who it was in my very early stages of podcast, and I think it was episode three. And uh, he did like big management consulting jobs before he got into like interior design and running design studios. Yeah. But he was like, do you know how to really tell somebody that's good at sales is asked to see a picture of their partner. <laughs> and he's like, cause if they've got a good looking partner and they're not that good looking, you know, they've got to be good at yeah, the job. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's one like, yeah, sure like, way of doing it, but probably not the best way. <laughs> no, I don't think you'd be able to get away with, uh, with, <laughs> yeah. ask, with asking to look at someone. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, excuse me. What are you going about? <laughs> but, um, but no, so, and you obviously experienced a huge amount of growth, right? So from going from, like you say, starting a business and being like, oh my God, like we're fucked because COVID yeah. and then turning over millions of pounds per year. Like how does that hunger and motivation keep going when you, when you kind of like, when you look at it from a business perspective and go, we've kind of made it like we're, yeah, we're yeah. doing well. Like yeah, yeah. how do you keep yourself motivated? How do you keep the team motivated? Yeah. And it, it almost, it's one of the, as a, as a, a background in recruitment, very, you know, ego driven, you know, how many how many how many sales you do is almost how how good you are mm. which is the, completely the wrong way of, of looking at something being doing a lot of sales doesn't make you a good person which yeah. is way more important than doing a lot of you know sales so to stay it, and it almost it almost changed when i started hiring people because i went from you know being the main man to all of a sudden well hang on a minute you need to make sure that everyone else is the reason why the company is doing well yeah and you almost have to take yourself off this shelf of being you know the, the, the poster boy of the company because you're the, the top salesperson and then you go look i'm not going to do it anymore i want to teach everyone else so it's a really humbling experience, experience doing yeah. that um and now my job i get kicks out of seeing people you know accomplish things outside of work so we've had 20 year olds who have been you know through our apprenticeship program who 
uh, of, of, you know, learned the tricks of the trade at a really young age and they've bought their first house on their own without any government or parent help when they started with nothing. And that's what I get my kicks out of mm. is, is, is really seeing what we can get people to achieve outside of work. Um, because again, if people have got stuff that they need to achieve outside of work and they've got these big goals, you know, buying houses, investments, uh, going on nice holidays, you know, wanting a car, you know, all of those are really nice things. Um, and it gives you a purpose to strive for inside of work. So the thing that keeps me motivated is watching other people do really, really well. And it's, you know, whenever I interview someone, I say, right, your next interview, you need to come back to me with what you want to achieve outside of work. And if, you know, we like each other, you want to work with us and we want to work with you, I'll help you achieve all of it. And what type of, uh, what type of things do these people say? And, and also, what if they come back and say, I want you to teach me to be a business owner so I can go and be a comp competitor for you one day? Yeah, that's fine. Obviously, you know, I'm not going to be, I won't teach someone to get to, to effectively replicate yeah. what we're doing and being in competition with us because that's legally not allowed until mm. obviously they're out of restricted covenants. And I'm sure one day that will happen. Yeah. But who am I to think that some of our employees wouldn't want to do that? Want yeah. that? Of course they will because, you know, they're driven and they're ambitious and they look up to us, hopefully. So I'm sure that. A lot of the people that work with us and hopefully they don't hopefully we can provide an environment where people feel you know safe and they feel that comfortable and they've and they got all thrive, of the yeah. you know the right environment to succeed and they they stay with us forever that's amazing that's what of course i'd want as a business mm -hmm. owner the reality is in sales a lot of people want to go and do more and more and more yeah. and that time will come and you know as long as they leave on a really positive note you know who knows i might want to try and go into business with that person Exactly. I mean, it's such a, it's such a mature, again, one of your values is obviously maturity and such a mature way of looking at things mm. and, uh, and seeing that as somebody that you want to go into biz with, business with. But you also mentioned something about helping somebody buy a house. Now, why is the reason why a lot of people leave is to get more money, right? Sure. You know, and if you're able to help people generate more money through having their own assets and et cetera, and et cetera, you kind of create an environment where you've already given that person the ability to go off and generate kind of income from outside, but yeah. then, and security to then go, do you know what? Well, actually, why would I want to leave? Because I might get more money, exactly. but is the culture the same or is, 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 is my boss going to be the same person? Yeah, exactly that. And, you know, we live in a world where, you know, em employers now, you have to have everything because yeah. people go down the road for, for an extra, you know, five quid on their salary I, I even had someone ask me um, in an interview, no word of a lie, and this is just, you know, it just shows where we are in, in time at the moment. Uh, I, I sort of, at the end of the interview, I said, right, have you got any questions? And they, they said, um, I just wanted to make sure that you've got a barista. And I just sat there and just thought, is that all you can come up with? Making sure that we've got a full-time barista to make you coffee. And have you? We do. <laughs> It's actually well. You do now. <laughs> we did. We, we, we did, um, and we've moved offices now, and we've we've now got a fancy iPad. Yeah. So you know, with the whole yeah. uh, AI um, automation uh, mm. conversation for for another day. Um, yeah, we've automated the barista into a, into an iPad. <laughs> but this is the, the point: is you need to really focus on what you can bring to your employee. You know, with your values and your environment and actual real life experiences with some of the people that have worked with mm. us. What we don't promote is, we, is you know, the classic sales, especially recruitment, um, BTEC, Wolf of Wall Street stuff, where you'll make loads of money and you'll go and spunk it every, you know, payday in Birmingham or on a night out and you're buying bottles and da da da. da. We don't do that. So if, you want to come in and learn, you know, why it's important to have a good credit rating or what, you know, a mortgage is or what investments are. And we're getting really young people who are very, very successful in all of those areas. Yeah, come and work with us. But we're not interested in you making loads of money and then not knowing how to spend it. Mm. So, yeah, we hopefully provide the environment that people need in order to succeed rather than go off the rails. Yeah, because I suppose that they're the characters that will always be striving for more because they just don't have what's in within them to be able to, like, utilise what they already have. 
Hundred percent. Yeah, exactly. And those are the characters that you're right. How how do you get to a point? We've got you know people under twenty five, even earlier than that, earning really good amounts of money, like 130, 140, 150 and above. Wow. You know? And it's a lot of pressure mm-hmm. as a young person to even have that sort yeah. of money. So we really, really need to emphasize what it's like to be in their position. It's a lot of money. Of course, because, you know, why should you be motivated at that point? You, you've, if, if you go down to what I did when I was a kid, go down to the pub Weatherspoons on a Friday night and I'm trying to get as many drinks with 20 quid, probably sometimes not even that. And, you know, you're sitting in that same circle getting 150, 160K a year in that friendship group. You've made it. Mm. Socially, you've made it there, haven't you? So, yeah. like, why should they want to go on and do more um, in terms of their personal development or career development? So, you know, that's why we offer you know free financial advice it's why we uh, do sessions on real life experiences um, like how to buy a house for example um, it's why we offer free pt sessions we do yoga every wednesday we try and look after ourselves you know um, physically and mentally uh, we offer free counseling because we realize how again how much pressure is on yourself if you start doing really really well at an early age and also if you're not doing really really well at an early age and you're next to someone who is Mm. Again, a lot of pressure. And so also the demons that, that potentially come from before, you know? 100%. Yeah, yeah. So we, again, you know, you can't just be offering um, an environment where it's cool to have a barista. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone loves a coffee. But what are you trying to do outside of work? That's what I'm impressed by. So you're obviously in your early years as a as a business owner. Yeah. What's next for you? Um. So... We want to try and focus on what we've actually built now. You know, Sam's really f- funny because he's always off trying to build something else. And I'm the person who's like, right, how do we get this, you know, performing and running and making money? And then he almost comes back and then I build the other thing. So it's like we, we work really, really, really well. So we've both said, right, we've got our three businesses at the moment. We've obviously got other investments that we make and we, we are shareholders of other companies. Um, but for for the businesses that we've actually built, we want to try and scale. Um, and hopefully in the next sort of two, three years, we're at about 40 people. We want, you know, over 100, 150 people working for us. So, yeah, just try and grow what we've already made. Mm. Um, and then looking at international markets, one of the reasons I'm over here at the moment. Nice. I suppose that was my kind of like next question Segway. as well is England. Live, like, <laughs> we played paddle together last night and I was like, I don't, I don't know how you, you live in who, England. Who, who won that game? Uh, Fred and Seb. Oh, we came second by oh, one point. We oh, beat really? you by one point. Oh, God. <laughs> I want to hear. <laughs> but um, living in England, like I've lived here for 10 years now and I can never see myself going back. Sure. Uh, from the outside in, I was having a discussion with my mum about how the UK and how it's run appears. Yeah, yeah. And when you hear about all these horror stories of people breaking into jewelry shops, getting robbed on the streets for their sh- watches, knife crimes up. From somebody that lives there, like, how do you see the UK at the moment? Like, what's it like for you? It's a scary place. Um, but, you know, I think the UK's always been, you know, when I grew up, especially when I was in Marston Green, um, you know, right next to Chelmsley Wood, which is considered a really rough area of Birmingham. And I was playing out there with my friends every night. And, you know, you do see things that you probably shouldn't be seeing as someone who's who's that age. And I think every area has got that. Obviously, we mm. Dubai, you can't really compare the two. Dubai is a completely different culture. But if we focus on England, yeah, the way that the government have, have ran, you know, um, the country over the last 10 years has been abysmal, especially during, you know, lockdown when the the nation needed, you know, those leaders the most, they let every single person down. Um, and it's, again, we've got, we've got this culture where it's almost like the government versus the public. Yeah. Whereas you come over here and I speak to <clears> business <throat> owners and it's a great place to be a business owner over here. You know, you've got the government really, really incentivizing people to start business out here. Whereas, you know, every single month through our business, we've got a massive, uh, you know, sum of money that we need to go and 
pay as as tax um everything is, has got a lot of tax uh they want to try and take as as much you know sort of freedom and, and money away from you as, as possible and i don't want to paint a picture like the uk is just a shit place to be there's a lot of opportunity in the uk and you know again you and i are both mm. very 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 lucky to even hold a, a UK british passport, passport yeah it, it's almost like a you know free entry into a lot of places um so I think the UK has got a lot of opportunity. Um, you know, I think that would I want to, again, you know, I'm about to have a child. Are there better places to, to raise children? Probably. Yeah. Um, do I see myself there forever? I'm not sure. Uh, you know, my wife is caught. We always have that conversation, especially I'm, I'm staying with a friend over here and every night, you know, we'll be having dinner and it will be like it you know, a hard sell of trying to get me to move over here. Probably one, because we play paddle together, but two, mm. because obviously he's a, a business owner out here and he, and he really sees the benefits of it. Logan. Yeah. Logan. Yeah. Um, I think he's been on, on the podcast before. So, um, so yeah, I think the stage of the light uh, of my life that myself and my wife are at, you know, we're about to, uh, we're really excited to start a family. Um, you know, we've got a really good system and support network at home through family that obviously we're close with who can who can help. Um, and I've got a lot to focus on with with growing the business and, and making sure that we've provided an environment for everyone to succeed in. So, yeah, we've got a lot going on. Uh, will I be in England forever? I don't know. Nice. Well, thank you very much for coming down today. It's, it's been a pleasure. Um, it's been good to be It's been really here. interesting to hear about kind of like especially the first part of your life, like uh, and people underestimate how difficult it would be to follow a dream and then not come to fruition, but then start again and actually go on to create something successful. Um, so yes, credit to you, man, credit. And it's uh, it's been a pleasure to meet you. And yeah. I, I look forward to keeping an eye on, on how things go with the business and and if you do ever make it into uh, international waters and uh, will, expand. 100%. Yeah, nice. yeah it's, been, it's been good to be here. I've enjoyed it. Um, yeah, thanks for having me on. Well, uh, as I say every week, guys, if you enjoyed that episode just as much as we did, uh, maybe there's a friend that just needs to hear this or a brother or a sister or a mum or a dad. Um, prime, prime example, this week's story, follow the dream. That dream didn't come to fruition, had to start again, but has gone on to achieve great things. And I know full well, especially when you hear the fundamentals of his business, hard work. I always say every week, for me, I left school with one GCSE, but I worked hard and I've done all right in my life. And I think if you apply some of these core ethics that we've spoken about today, you can go on and achieve great things. And I want to just spread that message to people and get it into as many eyes and ears as possible. So subscribe, like, comment, share. Um, and thank you very much for tuning in. So we'll see you again soon.